Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to our conversation with Daniel Kemp, Global Chief Investment Officer of Morningstar Investments. Uh, we are so glad to have uh, Dan join us today. I do have to start off with our usual compliance read, so I'm going to take care of that right now uh, so that we can get on to our conversation with Dan, uh, which is a very important conversation as it applies to the recent bank failures and the conversation surrounding them. Uh, today is March 14th, 2023. Uh, Louis Tranquilly is an investment advisor representative of Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC. This content is provided for information purposes only and should not be considered investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any type of securities. Neither myself, Mr. Tranquilly, nor Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC, nor Morningstar, LLC, are responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken due to information provided here and do not warrant or guarantee the accuracy or completeness of the information provided. The information discussed here reflects the views of myself and Daniel Kemp, as the date of the show and are subject to change without notice. Clients of Tranquility Financial Advisor, LLC, may hold positions in securities discussed in this video. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Any forward-looking statements or forecasts are based on assumptions and actual results may vary from any such statements or forecasts. No reliance should be placed on statements or forecasts when making investment decisions. Accordingly, viewers should not rely solely on the information provided in this video making any investment decisions. There is a risk of loss from investing in securities, including the risk of loss of principal. Different types of investments involve varying degrees of risks. There can be no assurance that any specific investment will be profitable or suitable for a particular investor's financial situation or risk tolerance. Asset allocation and portfolio diversification cannot assure or guarantee better performance or eliminate risk of investment losses. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us as I speak with Dan Kemp, uh, Global Chief Investment Officer, Morningstar Investments. Dan, thank you so much for jumping on a, a, a meeting right away. I, you know, I know, as I've joked with you before, you are that person in the ivory tower, uh, but not really. You are welcome to, or you are willing to come and have a conversation with with people mm -hmm. that uh, are invested with Morningstar, even those that are not as part of Tranquility Financial Advisors. So I cannot thank you enough for getting into this conversation immediately. I know clients and the people that our clients will share this with will thank you and appreciate it as well. So how about if we jump right into it and, and get to this conversation? Uh, we'll try not to take a whole lot of time from uh, our, our, our clients' days, but really want to get this information out because I think it's so important. So let me start with I would like to not cover this in a way that everyone has heard, if you will, over the last couple of days, which is this is an isolated incident. Uh, the U.S. has the government has already stepped in and said we're going to support. We've heard that part. Maybe we can give a little bit more of what research uh, goes on at someplace like Morningstar. So if you could start there, what research when when news like this breaks in a bank which is the second largest bank failure in U.S. history, occurs, what happens at Morningstar? How do you start digging into what is the what is the real news, if you will, behind what we're, we, we are all reading on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so, sure, Lou. And just to say uh, thanks so much for uh, having me on. It's a real privilege to talk to oh, you and your, your clients. And uh, it's, it's a really busy and, and worrying time, so delighted to, to talk about what, what's going on. So, uh, the, the first thing to say is that at Morningstar, we have a, a motto, which is that we prioritize research over reaction. So the first thing that happens uh, when we get news, as we had last week, about what was happening with SVB is that we want to really dig down and understand what's going on. Because we uh, we have a number of, of emotions that run through, uh, run through us, the same as they run through every other investor. And the, the first is, uh, whenever you're surprised by something, then your natural reaction is to get out of the way. Uh, and that uh, that can sometimes work, but in investment is normally the wrong thing to do. And so uh, calming yourself down uh, and not immediately jumping, but instead uh, finding uh, finding out what's really going on is, is the key. The second reaction, which can be equally dangerous, is to get 
too greedy too quickly. So when we see the, the price of an asset fall, then naturally uh, the inclination is, well, we should, we should go and add to this. And again, uh, that is perfectly natural, but can be a real mistake. So the first, first thing to do in any situation like this is to not do anything, uh, yeah. but to just try and dig down and, and understand what's going on. And as we, as we did that, what we want to what we want to think about is has anything really changed for the the sector as a whole uh, or individual stocks that we own or that we're interested in in owning and and we'll, I'm sure we'll we'll get into that and as you say we're now a few days on from the from the uh, news breaking and so some of these things have been uh, have been addressed already this time last week we didn't know or late last week we didn't know what the U.S. government was going to do what the U.K. government was going to do with the U.K. version so we we do know some of that now. But equally, we're still seeing really sharp movements in uh, in stock prices around the world, uh, and so it's it's important to to again not react to that, but think about the long term consequences of what's going on. All right, and I do want to point out that uh, we do have questions from clients, and they they go right to that the heart of that uh, commentary, Dan. So take me back to to Morningstar. Your first your first reaction is to not react. Take that deep breath. Maybe uh, don't pick up the phone and call for 24 hours, kind of thing. Where where you just let's let's take a moment to pause. Which, by the way, is a practice. It took me a long time to adopt, uh, mm-hmm. but I do take 24 hours, and it really is helpful in in with perspective. Take me into, if you will, the the researchers' conversations about what they do. Uh, so now mm-hmm. they calm down. They're 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 looking at this. Do they start calling analysts they know? Do they start t- talking with uh, banks that they're familiar with? If you would, if you can, share a little bit of what what they're doing uh, to to reassure themselves that the investments that you're holding are are worthwhile. Yeah, of course. So so there's really three things that are that are going on at, at, at the same time. That the first is that we have folks in our team at Morningstar whose uh, part of their role is to maintain coverage on the banking sector as a whole, on financials as a whole, both uh, in the US and around the world. And so they'll be thinking about what's happened in the context of, uh, does this change anything for our view of, of banks? We have a uh, we have an ongoing view of, of banks, of their, their valuation, the risks involved. And so they, they started off thinking, right, does this do anything to our view of banks? Next, uh, as folks will probably know, we have a a large analyst team within Morningstar that just focuses on individual stocks, individual companies. And uh, we have a, a banking analyst there called Eric Compton. And so we jumped on the, the, the phone with Eric on, on Friday and he ran, ran uh, through with us not just what was happening with SVB, but also the analysis he'd done on other regional banks and where he saw the dangers uh, and where some of the opportunities lay. And again, this is... This is information that he was publishing uh, outside of Morningstar as well, but just to be able to uh, to sit with with Eric and, and have that um, and have that conversation is is enormously helpful because he's the analyst on the individual securities. Uh, we didn't cover uh, SVB, but we covered other regional banks. He was able to provide that perspective. And then third, uh, we're always looking for uh, things that have suffered collateral damage. Because when you get into a situation like this, naturally your attention turns to uh, banking stocks, maybe regional banking stocks uh, that have fallen a long way, and you start thinking about, well, what, what are these cheap enough to buy uh, yet, or or will they um, suffer uh, from the, the same drivers that, that's taken a Silicon Valley Bank down uh, over, over the last week or so? But but what tends to happen in this situation is that other assets get impacted as as well. So we saw sharp movements in. Uh, in bond deals, in government bond prices uh, last week and into this week. Uh, We saw sharp movements in uh, asset class that were completely unrelated. We saw sharp movements in uh, in banks in other parts of the world, which come under different regulations, have different different challenges. And so that's where we tend to focus uh, on trying to find some opportunities as well. Things that have been caught up in the panic, uh, but aren't fundamentally impacted by by what's going on. So all those three things are happening at, at once. 
And as with, with any situations, there's two things that we want to do. First is raise the level of conversation within the team, uh, because you want to get that range of different perspectives. If you just sit there and stare at it by yourself, uh, you can get a very biased view, and that's true with all investors. Uh, sure. So, so to, getting that range of, of views is so important. Uh, but then having that uh, communication uh, with uh, with our clients and folks outside the firm as well, so that people know what's what's going on and uh, and and how it's impacting portfolios. Okay, well, well done. Thank you. That's I think that's exactly what I was looking for in that question. Uh, in that, just give me the things that happen so that uh, we can share them right here, which which you've done. So uh, you you've given us a bit of how to interpret all of the news, but. We touched on it. So there, were, there was the initial reaction that that uh, that shock, if you will. It is a surprise, and 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 I'll get to client questions because I think uh, they've done a great job in sending them back to me. But you move away from the initial shock. Now you're into the hey, are there values out there? And uh, something I haven't shared uh, really with clients ever, but I've had the benefit of spending. Uh, just under five years on the uh, board of a regional bank uh, right here in New Jersey. So it was a very good bank that ultimately was sold to a larger super regional bank, as they're known. Uh, and it was great experience. I mean, just a, just insight to see a well-run uh, bank uh, operate and be successful. How do we interpret the initial news of everything's OK, don't worry about it. And, but now what's coming out with, let's say, uh, additional news of regulations being relaxed, who's to blame for regulations being relaxed? Uh, I've mentioned before in, in no bragging way whatsoever, but I read The Wall Street Journal and The New York Times uh, as much as possible each day because we'll just say those are two different perspectives. Uh, and then I throw The Economist in there for you as well, Dan, OK, because that comes out of, out of the UK. So how do we you already talked about it, bring it in, calm it down now, a few days later, what does it mean from a systemic standpoint to banks this the breakdown is of SVB along with Signature Bank as well. What, how do we interpret that now? Well, I think there's there's a couple of things going on. That the first is that uh, what happened in SVB was in some ways uh, unique, and it was unique in the sense that SVB focused on a, a very particular part of the market uh, that was seeing very high levels of cash inflow uh, from private equity backers uh, and that cash that was that was being injected into these uh, private equity ventures was sitting uh, there at SVB and these are typically small entities uh, that didn't need to borrow. Uh, one of the characteristics of a venture capital firm is that it tends to be equity back. They tend not to borrow. They don't borrow in, in big size. And so they're actually not very attractive banking prospects uh, because banks make money, as you know, by, by lending. Uh, and VCs don't want to, don't want to borrow. Uh, they've got cash funding. And so they're not very attractive. So having the relationship with SVB that typically came from the, the private equity sponsors was, was very useful uh, for these small private equity backed venture capital firms. They banked with SVB, they deposited their money with SVB, but of course, many of these banks weren't actually, uh, many of these banks, many of these uh, smaller uh, venture backed companies aren't actually making money. They're not bringing cash flow in. They've got negative cash flow uh, as, as they're spending more than they're, than they're earning. So SVB was in a very odd situation. They had very uh, large deposits, uh, but, no, but, not, uh, but not able to lend to businesses um, to support that positive positive cash flow. So that is a that is a unique situation. What's not unique is that in an environment where uh, more people want to deposit cash uh, than borrow cash. And of course, we've just come out of the pandemic where uh, the economy was very well supported while everyone was stuck at home. And so uh, savings rates uh, went up, deposits went went up, but people weren't uh, keen to borrow. Then, of course, the banks uh, bought uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and, and other things. And as we've seen interest rates rise, uh, then that's caused uh, losses. And, that, and that's not limited to SVB. That's throughout the, the banking system. 
And people have focused on uh, this uh, this relaxation of, of regulation. It's, it's always good to focus on changes in in regulation and relaxation. But but remember that uh, the the bigger banks in the U.S. the sy- systemically important banks have different regulations, uh, so they they're not as as impacted and equally having much larger, more diverse businesses, then they didn't have to be so reliant on lending money to the US government. But what's so important in this situation is that although uh, the price of those bonds has fallen as interest rates have risen, uh, remember that these are typically uh, very safe loans. It's a very different situation from what we had in the global financial crisis uh, um, uh, sort of uh, 14 years ago or so, where the the problem was that uh, money was being borrowed by people that really uh, shouldn't have been borrowing money. This is a very different situation. Uh, but nevertheless, these these banks across uh, across the US do have have losses. In some cases, those losses are, are larger, not not so large. But what's really uh, done for SVB and and others is that banks exist on confidence. And as soon as that confidence is gone, then almost uh, any bank is incredibly vulnerable to people taking their money out. That's why we all uh, know of and fear bank runs. Uh, that's that's the, the deep problem at the heart of all banks. And that's why uh, governments provide deposit protection and why central banks tend to step in uh, when they see this sort of situation. Well, 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 well done all the way through. And and just for a, a brief explanation, the lending part of it, if we if we take a dollar and put it into a bank, that bank can really lend out, depending on what size bank they are, they can lend out three, four, four dollars against that single dollar. And that's exactly what SVB were caught in. They were not they were not putting out. Uh, if you will, on the street, uh, loans that were were profitable, they were si- simply buying these treasuries. Uh, they didn't have a loan portfolio to support the bank's income. So mm-hmm. as soon as there were, call it two pressures, uh, not much cash coming in from the venture capitalists. And of course, rising interest rates driving the value of their bonds down, they, they couldn't help. Now, the obvious question becomes, how the regulators let that happen, but let's get to that in just a moment because you mentioned it earlier as your analyst and you bring the team together uh, and you, you talk about it so that you, you you see different perspectives or hear different perspectives from different analysts. The, pers- the, the perception of this in the UK uh, and anything like this in the UK, because if I recall correctly in reading about SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, they, they were act- active in the UK as well. What has been the reaction in the UK versus the reaction uh, that you've already seen in the US. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in some ways, a very similar reaction in that uh, the, the the venture capitalists that had their money tied up in the UK branch of SVB uh, immediately um, uh, shouted about how important their businesses were and how they would collapse if the government didn't support the UK branch of, of SVB. And, and we see that every time there's uh, financial trouble, that uh, that those who are uninsured uh, naturally engage in, in special pleading uh, in order to, to try to, um, to to force the hand of the, of the government. We saw that in the UK um, over the weekend. Uh, so that's that's quite traditional. But what was also quite traditional is the response of the, the Bank of England, the Central Bank in the, in the UK, and also the, the government in that uh, they affected a sale of um, of the, the the UK bank uh, to HSBC, which is uh, I think Europe's largest bank, certainly the largest bank in the, in the UK. Uh, so uh, so a huge uh, a huge bank that was able to to um, uh, to swallow up uh, the UK branch of SVB, and that happened uh, I think before the markets opened on on Monday. And so there was there was very little uh, genuine panic there. And uh, 30 years ago in markets, we used to refer to this as the governor's eyebrows. Because uh, banks periodically get into trouble, uh, and the 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 old tradition in the city was that when a bank got into trouble, uh, then the, uh, the, the then the the, the, gov- the governor of the Bank of England was just uh, not away at a at a large uh, important bank uh, who would step in and and buy the uh, and, and buy the struggling bank, and and then it would all be all be dealt with in this sort of small club uh, that used to be the the city, but. 
Times have changed a long way, but actually what we saw on the weekend was a, was a very a very similar response to that, that uh, the bank affected this, this, uh, this sale. So HSBC uh, bought a, a client bank uh, that is very useful to, to them. Uh, obviously, the, um, the assets that they have are, um, again, pretty low risk. Uh, and so they just have to provide that, that cash, that ongoing funding. Liquidity. So, so in some ways, similar uh, to, um, uh, to, to what's happened in the, in the US, but the important thing is that didn't stop uh, UK equity markets falling sharply yesterday. And so that's a great example of how people um, uh, are driven by the emotions, even when the problem in the in the UK, at least, is dealt with very swiftly. Outstanding. Uh, and again, I, I do appreciate you bringing up the emotion because that's part of the reason that uh, clients work with Tranquility Financial Advisor and they'll share this video is that we will remove that emotion instead uh, staying focused on, on what ultimately is the goal. And I, I, I've said it many times before, uh, there were times during 2008, uh, the global financial crisis that had you invested uh, right now, that that investment may look very nice if you had held on to it. So there, it's it sounds cold hearted and everything else, but, but there are opportunities that will present themselves during this time. So it's, it is interesting to hear that uh, in the UK, reaction very similar to the US emotion. And that's a, a part of our job is to, uh, to remove some of that, but not all of it, because as it was pointed out to me yesterday, uh, there are real people behind the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank that are not receiving paychecks because their employer uh, dealt with that bank. So for the period of time, they have to wait to, to receive their money uh, because the U.S. government steps in. So thank you for all that. All right, I want to get to the questions, Dan, because, again, we wanted to keep this uh, very focused. Uh, and uh, what solution, if someone wanted to find a solution, is there other than a regional bank or even a large bank? Is there some other place to go put your, your dollars uh, and have them safe, if you will? Now, we can't talk about securities as safe, all right? That's But we're talking about cash. Where else could you go and we'll say store cash that you could write a check against and have it secured? Yeah. So, uh, Lou, I, I'm going to be mildly controversial here and say that, Do of it. course, it, de it depends on your time scale. That right. cash is actually the riskiest investment you can have if you have a long-term investment time scale, uh, because we know that it's not going to deliver a good, positive, real return for you over the long term. So if this is long-term money, uh, then then seeking safety uh, is is actually uh, the riskiest thing that you can do. It's not risky for you right now, but it's it's very risky for your for your future. So 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 with that in mind, uh, what well what can folks do? And and I listen. I think. Um, money uh, in a uh, in a in a large um, U.S. bank uh, is going to be uh, well looked after. At the, the same time, you can have the uh, money market um, money market funds as, as well, and um, people could uh, buy very short term uh, treasury bonds. But in reality, for that amount of money that you need uh, to, to cover, let's say, unforeseen expenses or a, a big expenditure that you have coming up in the, in the next next year or two, uh, then money in a, in a large bank uh, is, is probably a, a, as well as you can do. And even in a, in a regional bank, uh, because what we've seen, of course, is that uh, the, the US government stepped in immediately uh, to protect the depositors, including those those companies, the, the venture capitalists who are um, who are struggling to make payroll, as you said, and we've got to remember uh, the say the human cost of this. But but the government stepped in uh, to guarantee those those deposits above the um, the, the the typical kind of uh, ins insured limit. So so the, the government has once again, as they did in the financial crisis, uh, stepped in to, to support savers. Uh, and so I think we can have probably more confidence this week uh, in having money in the bank than we could last week. Last week we knew what the uh, uh, the insurance limit was the deposit guarantee limit, mm. uh, but we didn't know what the what the government would do. But what they've shown is uh, that they're willing to step in again. Right. And I would point out uh, for those that asked that question, there, there was more than one. I have recorded the difference between SIPC insurance and FDIC insurance. Uh, and it, I believe, uh, is is OK to point out now that the SIPC guarantees cash. And this is a 
this is really an important distinction inside investment accounts up to a half a million dollars, not the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of FDIC. Now that means it doesn't make one better than the other. It just means you you have protection against cash. Cash is not a security, so they're not guaranteeing a half million dollars of securities. It's cash, and the reason that's important is because the securities, if you own them through Morningstar, as an example. And if I can just use an example, Apple is in someone's uh, portfolio. That client actually owns Apple. They're 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 recorded. So when someone receives the proxy statements in the mail from uh, from Axos, my, my custodian, and it annoys them because there's paperwork coming in the mail, uh, they have to be sent, and that's proof that you own that security. So it's there are two different things. You can go find the YouTube video that I recorded a while back: SIPC versus FDIC. Uh, and uh, and by the way, for everyone watching, hit the subscribe button. And anytime we do one of these videos, it'll come out automatically. Uh, is it safe to invest in banks? Now, again, we have to keep this compliant. We can't just say anything that we want. But by safe, meaning you've you've done the analysis, you still find the U.S. banking system worth with the U.K. banking system, banks, financial institutions worthwhile to invest in. I I, I think the answer is yes. See you shaking your head. Give me yeah, some comfort so, on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, again, we have to define safety. And so uh, banks are uh, typically quite volatile uh, stocks. Uh, and right. so they, you know, they will go up and down. So if your definition of safety is something where the price doesn't move uh, one month to the next, then absolutely not. The banks do not fit uh, that, that criteria. But the other type of safety is, uh, do you expect a, a good uh, rate of return from this investment over the long term? Uh, given all that that short-term price volatility that's just a, a feature of, of investing, uh, do you expect a, a, a good level of return? And of course, what's what's happened uh, over the last week uh, shows that the banks, particularly large, well-capitalized, well-regulated banks, are safer this week than they were last week. Uh, because the price is much lower. And so when the price is much lower, you have this greater margin of safety uh, between the price that you're paying and a, and a realistic view of the of the fair value. And so that's often when the best investments are are made. And so I, I certainly wouldn't say uh, just just have banks in your portfolio or um or or have have some smaller banks or banks that are um you know that are, that are, that are troubled the, the importance of of building a portfolio is, is having a broad range of diversification but as we look at um uh, particularly global banks today uh we're seeing better prices than we saw last week and so uh, good opportunities we, we we looked at banks over the over the last couple of months we've seen some some good opportunities uh but they're typically even even better today so again no no advice there uh do get Get your get your get your advice from Lou. Uh, he's the best person <laughs> nice to, to advise you. Um, I I don't give advice to, to any investors. I'm just saying what no, we're no, we seeing are. as we look at uh, the, the world through a pure investment lens. Well done, thank you uh, again, and thanks for that uh, that that commentary about uh, talking with Lou as well. Uh, you can give me a brief answer, yes or no. Do just fine. Uh, is uh, ESG investing in any way, shape, or form? responsible for this bank breakdown? No, Lou, I, okay. I, I can't see that at all. I, it, okay. it, it's there's There's been some um, some reference to really odd, sort of odd aspects of, um, of ESG with this, but no, that, that doesn't make any uh, any sense to to me? This was a this was a bank that had a a, a mismatch between very concentrated depositors and uh, concentrated uh, lending book to the um, to to longer term security. So no, I wouldn't see ESG as 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 having any role in this at all. Okay, I appreciate that, Dan. We really appreciate you taking uh, just about twenty five minutes here to to help uh, frame this conversation. Uh, now, this today is uh, Tuesday, March 14th, and we really just heard all of this on Friday, um, had one full day of market activity in the U.S., and here you are giving us the time to talk about it. I can't say thank you enough for that. Uh, and, uh, of course, we're going to ask you to come back and talk again with everyone, uh, and hopefully next time it's it's not necessarily about bank failures. It's about uh, some other uh, news that's really uh 
we'll say positive, but look, we'll we'll deal with it as it comes. Of course, that's our work, and we love doing it. So, Dan, thank you so much for uh, some time today, and uh, we will talk with you again. Delighted to see it. Thanks for having me. All right, of course. Today is March 14th, 2023. Uh, Louis Tranquilly is an investment advisor representative of Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC. This content is provided for information purposes only and should not be considered investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any type of securities. Neither myself, Mr. Tranquilly, nor Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC, nor Morningstar LLC are responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken due to information provided here and do not warrant or guarantee the accuracy or completeness of the information provided. The information discussed here reflects the views of myself and Daniel Kemp as the date of the show and are subject to change without notice. Clients of Tranquility Financial Advisor LLC may hold positions in securities discussed in this video. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Any forward-looking statements or forecasts are based on assumptions and actual results may vary from any such statements or forecast. No reliance should be placed on statements or forecasts when making investment decisions. Accordingly, Viewers should not rely solely on the information provided in this video making any investment decisions. There is a risk of loss from investing in securities, including the risk of loss of principal. Different types of investments involve varying degrees of risks. There can be no assurance that any specific investment will be profitable or suitable for a particular investor's financial situation or risk tolerance. Asset allocation and portfolio diversification cannot assure or guarantee better performance or eliminate risk of investment losses. Mm -hmm.